The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Benjamin J. Heckendorf. Every week he takes on new projects, shares tips and tricks, and answers your viewer questions on The Ben Heck Show. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we'll show you how to get started with the Texas Instruments MSP430 microcontroller using the Launchpad Development Board. Let's get started. But first, the news. Today on Ben News, I want to show you the new upgraded America's Most Haunted test rig. Uh, we have some new parts on it. We have a new 48 volt power supply with 12 amps of current, more than enough to make the flippers go. A new uh, audio amplifier with subwoofer support. Uh, switching power supply for the uh, 12 volts and 5 volts that the Logic runs off of. It's an arcade style supply. And we have a subwoofer and new flipper fidelity speakers. So now the flippers are much stronger and the game shoots even faster than ever. Here's a demo. All right, let's try this out. Love the paranormal is Look how much power there is. <laughs> Look how much faster the flippers are. However, the new power supply did not prevent me from draining. Want to see a cool servo controlled laser demonstration I made? I set up this demonstration using the Texas Instruments Launchpad, which is a development platform for their MSP430 line of microcontrollers. Now I'm going to show you how you can get your system set up to use these microcontrollers for your projects. Let's look inside the MSP430 Launchpad box. All right, what do we get? Ah, okay, so this is the Launchpad itself, the development board, you can plug your USB cable right into it to get started quickly with your computer. And you usually get a couple extra chips. This is the larger MSP430 that's in it. Has like 8K of program space, 2K of RAM. Uh, you can swap it out, just unplug it first, remove that chip, and then we can put in the smaller one. The smaller chip is likely only 2K of program space and only one megahertz. But we can still use it for embedded applications. It's very important that you read the text on it so that you know which target MSP430 you're programming for. There's quite a few of them. If you don't set it right, it won't program. So there's two ways to program the MSP430. We can use Code Composer, which is from the Texas Instruments website, or we can use a fork of Arduino called Energia, which we can download from GitHub. We'll start with Code Composer. Here we are at Texas Instruments website. Get started with Code Composer on MSP430 microcontrollers today. Okay, let's do that. Blah, 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 blah. Download the latest Code Composer Studio. I want the Windows version. Now you're gonna have to sign up for a TI account in order to download this. And they also ask you a bunch of questions about like what country you're importing into and you know what your hair color is, but you know, that's fine. That's your own business, I guess. US government export approval. We're gonna export it into America. Exported from Detroit. All right, so we're gonna fill out this information and then we can download Code Composer Studio. A long time ago, when hacking was only done with an ax and mod was short for modern, Post-measurement analysis was in its infancy. Engineers around the globe struggled to transfer data to PCs and had to use primitive software tools to find the insights they needed. But now that's all in the past. The future is here with the new Agilent 34461A TrueVolt DMM, which stands for Digital Multimeter. Yield deeper analysis with onboard processing that will change the way you work, from routine tasks to troubleshooting. The TrueVolt DMM has built-in math functions, more insights in less time, visual feedback, and easier distribution of data. From screen captures to raw data, today's instruments make it easy to document tests and share results. Learn more about the TrueVolt DMM at element14.com, where you can also sign up for our upcoming Multimeter webinar. You can even register to win a free TrueVolt DMM in exchange for a product review. Being old-fashioned is good for some things. When it comes to post-measurement analysis, Get up to modern speeds at element14.com. Once Code Composer Studio is downloaded and installed, we're gonna go file, new, project, Code Composer Studio project, next. 
Okay, let's do a good old fashioned blink the LED project. And we'll call this Blinky, like the ghost from uh, Pac-Man. Now this is important, family MSP430 variant, we don't need that. But this is actually the type of uh, MSP430 we're using. So we have to make sure this number matches what's on the chip. Okay, so I believe this is what we have here. Yep. All right, let's hit finish. So this example blinks the LED. What I always like to do is change a variable so that I know that I affected it. So it's not like some built-in program that was already on the chip that I just got. So I'm gonna change that, save it. And we hit debug, which will debug it as well as program it. Debug as, all right. All right, it's now configuring the debugger and also programming the chip. Do, do, do. All right, no errors, so it should have worked. So on the debugger screen, we have to click play here before it'll actually start running the code. Okay, now we see that our blink file is working. And what's cool with this is you can actually debug it so I can pause it. So it pauses the execution of the microcontroller. And then I can look at things like the memory registers by going to view and, uh, I don't know, registers. So port one, two. This shows us what the pins are doing at the point that I paused it. So this is you know pretty handy if you want to actually debug stuff. So I'm gonna go back and resume it. And by hitting debug, just like with AVR Studio, you also program the device. So that's a basic way you can do it with the Code Composer Studio. Now let's look at a much easier way, Energia. Let's take a look at Energia. You can get it from GitHub or by going to the Energia site at energia.nu. Energia was the name of a Russian, or is it Soviet? Rocket? Rockets launch pad, <laughs> get it. Anyway, I'm gonna download the Windows version. It's a zip file. And this is just going to have a folder in it with Energia, and you can run it directly from the executable within that folder. So you can put that folder anywhere you want in your computer. I like to put folders like Arduino or Energia right on my C drive, so I don't have to set special permissions in order to copy files to it. Uh, yeah, so just hit Energia executable, bam, it's ready to go. Now this is very much like Arduino because it's basically a fork of Arduino or a different version of it. We can use a lot of the same examples. Uh, let's look at servo here, sweep. The one thing that is different are the pin declarations. This has servo attached on pin nine. We can't use that. So let's go back to the Energia website and go to home and uh, here we go. This is a very handy document. It shows us the board mappings of all the different chips. So it shows you the chips inside of the Launchpad development board and how they change. So obviously some of them have more pins than others. We are using this one, the 2452. So we can't put the servo on pin nine. The pins are actually called P1 underscore zero, P1 underscore one. So let's use P2 underscore two. So I'm gonna hook my servo up to that one. All right, we'll leave the power off for now. So back in my program, instead of pin nine, I'm going to type P2 underscore two so it matches the pin out on this. All right, everything else should be all right. We don't, yeah, okay. Everything else should be all right. So we go up to tools again. When we select the board, we want to make sure we select the right one. If we don't, it won't work. So that's this guy. Then we select the port, which is 33. 14 is my maker bot. Should upload. And there we go, it's working. All right, so there's P22. So we'll plug our signal into that. And then once we plug our voltage in, the server will start up. So what you can do with the MSP430 chip is you can remove it out of the launch pad once it's been programmed and embed it in something else. So we're going to do that. We're gonna stick it into a breadboard so I can set up that laser example we showed you earlier. We'll be using analog read to sense the two positions on a potentiometer joystick, just like your Xbox 360. And we'll use that to drive two servos which will control a laser beam. I'm gonna transfer the circuit now. I'm gonna take the MSP430 off of the launch pad development board and embed it right onto this breadboard. The MSP430 now works on its own. We don't need the development board. This controls the vertical. 
This controls the left and right. This has been our introduction to the Launchpad MSP430 development platform. You can buy the development platform and a chip at element14.com, program the chips, and then buy more chips so you can embed them into your projects. You can also use Code Composer or Energia to program them. Today's question comes from Ryan who asks, what's up with all those expansion ports on old video game consoles? Well, Ryan, those usually had access to the main system bus and were intended for expansion. Some add-ons are well known, like the Sega CD that plugs into the Genesis. Back in the day, the ColecoVision had an add-on to turn it into an Atari 2600. Others were more localized, like the Japanese Famicom disk system or the N64 disk system. The Sega Saturn could use its port to add more RAM for better animations during fighting games. The PlayStation 1 actually started life as a CD-based add-on to connect to the Super Nintendo's expansion port. But the deal fell through, which resulted in Sony making a standalone console themselves, and Nintendo using the Philips CDI system to release some bad, yet officially licensed, Nintendo CD games. As far as the hacker scene goes, the expansion ports on old computers are often used to add high-speed disk drive replacements and data transfer connections to our modern computers. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we'll take on a viewer challenge to build a do-it-yourself automatic time-lapse dolly for moving cameras. We'll see you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.